I want to welcome you to a special bonus edition of Romans Untangled, a podcast where we take a seemingly difficult book of the Bible and untangle it so that we can enjoy its beauty. This will be our last podcast of season one, and it is, again, a special bonus edition. If you're wondering what a bonus edition is, it's uh, it's something where we're going to ramble on for a long time. <laughs> I have not exactly, not exactly a full understanding of how long this will go, but I'm, I'm thinking it'll be about an hour. So if you want to, if you're driving a long driver, you might want to divide this one into, into portions. Uh, you go right ahead and do this. Bonus episode number two is what's the big idea of the very beginning of the Bible? And we're going to cover Genesis 1 to 11. If you try to read the Bible like you would any other book, you you find yourself in the very beginning and you will start in the book of Genesis. The Bible is not like other books in that it's 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 actually compiled of 66 other books compiled to make one book called the Bible. And the first 11 chapters of this first book of the Bible, Genesis, are so rich that they need extra time to think through all that is there. And so what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to unpack Genesis uh, 1 to 11 uh, in in our time together. If you remember back during the first season of Romans Untangled, every single time I've been trying to give you some type of tool so that you can understand God's Word better, a Bible study tool. Uh, I've done everything from talking about the nature of letters and how we understand communication theory and how we need to know as, as much about the person writing it, the person receiving it, the occasion that's happening, the words that are used. We've talked about cross-references. We've talked about a whole variety of different Bible study tools, following the context key, right? One of the things I brought up, and I brought it up on, I believe it was episode nine, is that in order to understand much of the New Testament, you really have to know the big peaks, the big the big ideas of uh, the Old Testament. Okay. And so I, I listed a few, uh, I think I listed nine here that, that are key to understanding. And I, and I said, first of all, you need to know the very beginning. You got to know Genesis one through 11. Okay. And that is before Abraham comes on the scene, before Israel's a nation or anything. You just got to know that whole thing. Very, take a deep dive into Genesis one through 11. Then you need to know about Abraham, starts in Genesis 12, goes on for quite a long ways. Then we need to know about the the nation now of Israel. Okay, so from then on, Israel is going to become a nation. It's going to go through all kinds of of different ups and downs. Uh, There's primarily a down when they get put into captivity. That's our third, uh, excuse me, our, our fourth one. So you got Genesis 1 to 11, the first part of the Bible. You got Abraham, then you got the, these, he's having more and more descendants. We're getting into a nation, but doesn't have any land yet or anything, but it gets held captive in Egypt. That leads us to our fifth thing, which is you need to know Moses uh, and the, the importance of Moses in the Old Testament storyline, how he delivers them, his own journey of struggling with trusting God, all of that. You have to follow that. Then there's a, uh, a giving of the law. Very important to understand uh, for for um, uh, understanding how how books, especially the Book of Romans, is going to interact with the giving of the law in the Old Testament and what that covenant is about. The promised land that is given and the inhabitation of that land given to them is number seven. Then the kings, especially coming into David and the importance of the kings, and then ultimately that they are then put into exile, which would bring us up to the time of the New Testament. So Genesis 1 to 11, Abraham, Israel, time of captivity, Moses' deliverance, giving of the law, promised land, the kings, and then the exile. Now there's a ton more in the Old Testament, believe me, but those are kind of the the peaks, the mountaintops, so that, that if you get at least that much, you can start to really grasp the foundation that the New Testament builds on. So I uh, uh, told you that I have a passion about the first 11 chapters of Genesis. If you are an attender at Hope Community Church, I often refer back to Genesis 1 through 11, and particularly Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, We'll look at some of that. 
Uh, so that's what I want to do. I want to have uh, you uh, just walk this through with me. The best, and I know a lot of folks are saying they do this when they're out for a walk and they're out for a run or maybe a drive, and you're listening to Romans Untangled. That's great. I really appreciate that. I think it's, hope it's fun for you. It sure is fun for me making these. Um, but this one in, in particular, it, it would be helpful if you had a Bible in front of you. <laughs> and I don't at all recommend that if you're driving, but uh, I'm going to take you through a buggy ride, a quick, a quick pass through Genesis 1 to 11. Not too quick. I mean, we're going to take an hour to do it. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I'm new at this whole podcast thing, and I jot down notes so that I keep myself kind of focused. I know where I'm going. It, it's it's a weird thing here to be in your basement by yourself uh, recording these things in as quiet of a room as you can possibly find. So I write down kind of quite a bit of notes. Let me tell you what my notes say about this. Here's exactly what it says. It says, open Bible to Genesis, period, talk, exclamation point. (laughs) So that's what we're going to (laughs) do. So we're going to open it up to the very beginning. And Genesis 1-1, it just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when I get to Genesis 1 and I'm working with some of our LDI students uh, and helping them to understand the very beginning of the Bible, one of the things I encourage them to do is I try to say, let's look at Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3 in particular, and pretend we know nothing about God. What do we learn? What this the, Obviously, the main character of the Bible is God. And so what, what do we learn? Well, just in this one verse, we learned that there was a beginning, but there was someone who created things, the heavens and the earth, at the time of the beginning. So in other words, they were before the beginning, the beginning of what we would now call time or, or, or all the things that we know that exist. There was this being, we don't know much about him yet, although he's, he's obviously very powerful and he's obviously not like we are because we don't create things like that. Uh, we're like them in, in some ways, but we don't quite have that level of, of, of uh, awesomeness, there's this God and he creates the heavens and the earth. He creates everything that there is. Then it goes on to say, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay. So there is this, uh, there's all kinds of interpretations on What does Genesis mean exactly like how the earth was made? When was it made? And I think not that those are unimportant questions, because of course they're important, but way more important is who, who is this God? He is the awesome God who creates all these things. So there's all kinds of interpretations on Genesis 2. Is there a gap between Genesis 1 and then millions and millions of years? And then 2, verse 2 happens, and then he starts his creative process. Do the days that are going to be talked about in in Genesis 1, do they actually refer to 24-hour periods? Or do they actually refer to to epochs? Um, There's all kinds of ways to interpret this. So I, I encourage you, It's beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do here. And um, I'm not 100% sure that it matters a whole bunch as long as you hold to what Hebrews says, that by faith we believe that God created the world. In other words, out of nothing, there's a a Latin phrase, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, or nihilo means nothing or zero. Out of nothing, God made something which is kind of a little bit ironic because that's pretty much what modern physicists are telling us right now, that if you packed, according to the Big Bang Theory, and I wasn't there, and is this how it happened or not? I don't know. I don't really know. But they say it was, everything was packed down so tightly, all the matter was put together, that it actually it was so tight, it went into what they would say was basically nothingness, and it went down to energy is what was there before. So, okay, whatever. I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't, I'm not, this is beyond the scope of what I'm trying to do here, but it's very important in order to understand this scriptural story to say that God is the, that God is the author of all this. God is the one that causes all this. God was not, um, he didn't just uh, create and walk away. He was engaged with his creation. 
um, and and some of these things. And he is the he is the cause of it. It wasn't just time plus chance. We didn't get really lucky. It was God doing it. How long it took, epochs or or minutes, I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. But to know that our God uh, could have done it any way he wanted to, we don't know. But the way it's described here, and again, the creation of the universe being described in one chapter of the Bible, obviously, is not a scientific way of talking about it. And he and he basically goes on and says um, that the, there was the first day is when he creates light. And he says, and the God called, I'm, I'm kind of moving around here, but in, in, uh, in verse five, he says, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. So is it possible this is a 24-hour period? It, it certainly is. It, it could very well. This could have been happened in seven days. The, the, the world possibly is 10,000 years old or whatever, 12,000 or whatever people say. I don't know. When I first became a follower of Jesus, there was two options. Uh, I remember them presenting that it was either time plus chance evolution, meaning that there was no, uh, God was not involved at all. God was not involved in the creation of the world, or it was 24 hour periods. Earth was 10,000 years old. That's the way it was. And so given those two options, of course, that's where I leaned in. I didn't have any science behind it. I just said, well, I, I have to believe that God created it. And if those are only two options given to me, there are a lot of options. Now, if you just go to different, uh, you know, different websites that talk about uh, creation and how God was engaged in it, there's a lot of different options out there that maybe merge a little bit more science with it. At the same time, you can't recreate it in a lab, so it's not anything we can necessarily prove happened. So all of these are possible. I want to be generous to all of them. Uh, the only thing that is out to be a biblical Christian would be to say time plus chance evolution. We got really lucky. Uh, there, was no, there was no creator. There was no designer. That, that's out. You, that, you can't have that. That's, that is a contradiction. Day two, uh, he creates a vault which he calls sky, and the, and then there was and and then he separates that from the water under the vault, which is going to be the earth, right? And then so he calls that vault sky, verse eight. And there was evening and there was morning the second day, third day. It says the waters on the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. It says, and this it's very important. So God speaks, and then it just says, and it was so. God speaks. This is our God. He just, when he speaks, things happen, things that weren't become. That's who we understand this God to be. He's that powerful, okay? Makes the dry ground land. And then it says again, and God saw that was good. Then on that, uh, on that same day, he also lets the land produce vegetation. And we have all kinds of fruit and, and plants and trees and all this according to their various kinds. And God saw that it was good, verse 12. And there was evening and there was morning, and that's the third day. Next day, there's lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the, from the night and let them serve as signs to uh, mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be the lights in the vault of the sky to give them light on the earth. And so so, God made two great lights, the great light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set the set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, to separate light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, okay? And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Fifth day, let the water team with living creatures, all kinds of things going on, on the fifth day. And not only, and God saw that it was good. And then he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day, the sixth day, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, the creature that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its own kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And then in the last thing that he does on day six, it says, and let us make man or mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Okay, so you see something really unique about humanity is that they're, they're not just created to be living creatures. There's something about them that's unique 
to all of creation, and they are made, it says, in the image and likeness of God. Now, they're not God. They are just made in the image and the likeness of God. And there's something about an image or a likeness that is very similar to, right? You know, you, 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 some people say about, maybe they say it about you, and they say you're a spitting image of your father or of your mother, right? In other words, there's a, you're not your father or your mother, but there's something about you that's, that, that's reminiscent. In other words, when they, when they look at you, it reminds them of them. I, I've been around siblings where the mannerisms are just incredible between the two of them. And it's just like, whoa, that's crazy. You're kind of an image of each other, a reflection of that, right? And and so we, human humanity, is a image of God, right? And God's later on the scripture gonna say, make no no make no icons or images, graven images of me. And the reason for that is because he's already made his image. He's made the thing that's supposed to be a reflection so that when people see it, they will see God. Now, they won't, won't worship the image, but it's a way for them to see it. And that's humanity, right? We're going to unpack that even a little bit further here as we get into Genesis chapter 2. And then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Okay? So the idea here is they have been given a mandate and that is to be fruitful and increase, fill the earth, and to steward the earth in such a way so that it flourishes as well. Human flourishing, right? That This is what's given. The creation mandate, this is often called. Genesis 1, 29. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the sky and the creatures of the moon and everything that has breath of life, I give every green plant for food. Okay, and so, and then he also says that to the people. He says that in verse 29. Sorry, I, I misspoke there. The blessing comes in verse 28, um, and the mandate is for human flourishing. And then he says he's going to give them, they give them everything to eat they can eat, verse 29. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completely in all their vast array. And then it says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had, he had uh, been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So so God rests and he rests on this seventh day. And the reason for the resting is not because he's tired. Okay, that's not what it says. It just says he had finished what he'd been doing. So he rests and he stops this work And he blesses that seventh day as a reminder of all that he had done because he rested on that day and everything was done. Now, I have no idea why chapter two doesn't end right there. I I often wonder, did they just kind of randomly guess where to put chapters? Because that, of course, wasn't in the, when uh, this was originally written. Chapter two really should begin in verse four, but it doesn't. and, And we'll pick it up here in verse four. Okay. On to chapter two. Chapter two four is a, a bit of a I, I even call it like if you were to go to Genesis one twenty uh, six and twenty seven, which is the part let us make man in our own image, right? And he created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female he created them. Uh, if you were to click on that hyperlink, kind of you know, like if it were a web page, it would take you to a further account of what actually took place on day six. So chapter two is a further account of what took place, okay? So, and we pick it up there, and it goes into how this took place. So we get to verse five, it says, Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had sprung up, for the Lord God not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So it kind of goes into more detail that not just they're going to create male and female, we're actually going to see how it happens. And the way he creates Adam is he forms, says, the dust of the ground. So somehow he collects this dust of the ground and he breathes onto it 
into whatever is forming as nostrils or whatever way that the this new this new thing, whatever just the dust ball, actually becomes a living being because God breathes on it. God's breath causes life to happen, right? Then it just describes where this person lives. This hasn't got a name yet, just where this person lives. And it says he, he, he planted a garden in the east and he called it Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. This is verse eight. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Very important paragraph here. So what's happening? We've got this, this garden, and I just think of the most luscious gardens. Carol and I have been to Thailand, Chiang Mai area, and there's just beautiful gardens that grow there. And they're just luscious, right? And God makes his garden, it's just, it's breathtaking, right? It's beautiful. And all these, these trees and plants are there and everything, and these trees are, have come up. They're pleasing to the eye. Most trees are, in my opinion, a tree lover, Right. And but they also have they also have fruit that is good for food, right? In the middle of the garden, there are two trees: tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The next paragraph is just going to talk about a little bit more of where the where this garden is. He's going to move on to verse fifteen and say, "The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it." So. Uh, it's very important you pick this up, that work was created for human beings, not as part of sin. We don't work because of sin. We work because we're designed to work. God works, we work. We're made like him. There's a satisfaction to it that came. It's right here in the garden. And then he commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but... You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay, there's one command. There's only one command. And it actually starts off by giving this huge freedom of choice. You can eat from any, you're free to choose, whatever you want. It's all yours. I'm a gracious God. But there is one tree, and I'm commanding you not to eat from that. Okay? Then we move on. Genesis 2, 18. And it says, the man, or excuse, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now that should be striking, just even in how we read it, where we hear the phrase, not good. Um, nothing in Genesis has not been good. A sin has not entered the world yet, so it's not a moral thing. Genesis 3 is when sin will enter the world. Uh, So not good does not mean sinful, it just means not done. There's something missing about humanity to be fully a reflection of the image and likeness of God if it's alone. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, isn't God alone? Well, that's this is a huge foreshadowing to the understanding of God as an eternal plurality or a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They lived eternally, they and he, so it's both three and one, and I know, I understand, one of the most the hardest things to understand is the Trinity. I'm not, don't believe, I just told you everything I basically know about it right there in that one sentence, three and one, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Spirit, the Father is not the Spirit. They're, each one of them is God, but they're not each other. There's three distinct persons, but they're one God. Okay? And I understand that is complicated. It admittedly is. I am not about, uh, uh, but but listen, if you think you could understand everything about everything, you wouldn't be finite. I, I have absolutely no idea, no idea how the microphone I'm speaking into right now goes through this wire, goes into my computer, goes on this little thing here, then goes over to the, the person who's going to fix it so it sounds better and takes out all the dumb words I say. Ha! <laughs> they haven't done that well so far. But anyway, that they do that. Then they put it up on up somewhere in the space, somewhere in outer space, and it comes back down and it comes to your computer or your device and you hear me. I, I have no idea how that works. And that is not that complicated. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, somebody does. Somebody knows how that works. I, I get it. 
But there's a lot of things in science that we just don't know. Like, uh, like take for instance the the light. Light is a particle and it's a wave. It is. You can scientifically show that. How can they be both? I don't know. I don't know. Right? It just there's there's mysteries here. And God, of course, one of the greatest mysteries of God is his being a plural, his being a singular plural, if that makes sense. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you see a little bit of that here that humanity must live in community in order, otherwise they're alone, and that's not okay. So God says he's going to do something about it. What's he going to do? He's going to make a helper suitable for him. So what happens next? Verse 19. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. On first glance, you got to stop at this and go, wait a minute, what's going on now? He, God looks at the situation and says, Adam, he doesn't say it out loud. It just says the Lord God, uh, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily in Adam's hearing or whatever, but he's saying it's not good for the man to be alone. He doesn't say it's not good for you to be alone. So it's, it's just something, it sounds like he's saying to himself, I will make a helper suitable for him. So God knows it's 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 not good for Adam to be alone, but I think Adam is probably thinking if if God were to tell him you're alone, he would say, "No, I'm not. Look at all these other creatures. There's tons of them." Right? So, what does God do? He brings all the animals to the man so that he would name them, right? And as he names them, there's something else happening, and we see this at the end of what I just read. We see it at the end of verse 20. It says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. In other words, uh, there, God and Adam are looking at these, and they're making evaluations. Here comes an animal. It's a big, big, tall neck, kind of yellow with black spots. Obviously, name's going to be giraffe. Really cool, God. You are quite the creator, but I don't really want to hang with the giraffe. Another big animal, huge, gray. The skin is just so different. Big ears, big tusks, right? Elephant, obviously. Not feeling it with the elephant. I mean, I'm glad they're here. Not feeling it. And so what happens is all the animals come before, I don't know how long this takes, but it takes a while. All the animals come before Adam. He names them all. And now Adam realizes that he's alone. See, God's a master teacher. You, you know that God knew that these would not satisfy him. But Adam didn't know that. So instead of just telling him, hey, Adam, you're alone, and just trust me, you're alone, he's a master teacher, and he allows Adam to actually experience it. So it feels awful now. It feels like, uh, you know, fourth and 99, here to use a football analogy. There's no way out of this one, and but... God delights in 4th and 99. So it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So what's happening here? God creates. God creates. And he creates Eve, but he, it's the only thing in all of creation that's created out of another thing, another another living thing, the only thing. The last thing that is created before God rests from everything is, is Eve. And to celebrate that, there's a little, the little phrase here. It says, he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. So there must have been some distance, uh, three feet, 30 feet, three miles, I don't know, of from where God took the, where Adam was sleeping and where God created Eve. And then he brings her to Adam. And I don't, again, I don't know the distance, but it's some distance to bring someone. And so there's this longing as Adam's waiting and he's seeing this come down. Now that probably brings an image to your mind, right? And the image is of a father who walks his daughter down the aisle. And in fact, when people stand, because the most honored guest is the bride in a wedding, She's the last one there, and she's escorted in as the as the as the most honored guest, and and the whole thing starts, and everybody rises. 
What that actually is is a picture of the last act of creation where God walked Eve down the aisle, figuratively speaking, to Adam. And it's a celebration of what God has done, the last act of creation. That's why people stand. And people don't know that. They think they're standing because she's beautiful and all that. And that's, that's very true too. But the husband, or excuse me, the father represents God and the, the bride here represents Eve in the last act of creation and what's happening there. Of course, there's some future things coming as well. If you look at the end of the Bible, which believe me, we're not going to Revelation, but this is the whole idea too, that, that there will be a bride and they will be brought to Jesus and uh, coming out of heaven, it says in Revelation 21 and, 20, 21 and 22, and, there, and that uh, there will be another reenactment. So people are responding to that as well. Then the passage says this, that, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and un- is united to his wife and they become one flesh. So whoever wrote Genesis, probably Moses, or had a lot of mosaic influence, uh, he's saying here, just because of what happened with Adam and Eve, let me tell you, this is exactly what happens now. We, we leave father and mother, we leave the authority of that household, but not for long, we're joined to another we're united to the wife, and they become one flesh. There's a covenant uh, of marriage where you make a co- a promises to one another. You make vows of commitment before God, before each other, before uh, family and friends, and in, in most places in the, in the world, uh, before the government, and where you're saying we are now legally bound as a new family. And then it says they become one flesh. And of course, this is referring to sex, God is a genius. He cre- he, the problem was man is alone, and he creates this experience that is to be done in the safety, safety and sanctity of marriage, of a oneness with intercourse. It's, a, it's physically a oneness, and yet it, it involves this intimate act that they're together with. And so it ends this aloneness. And then the last verse of verse tw- uh, chapter 2 is verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Okay? That, of course, is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in chapter 3 here, but it's also a little bit of what the goal of what God intended when he created marriage, and that there was supposed to be this relationship where in every area of your life, not just physically, physical nakedness is relatively easy, that in every area of your life, you're naked with another person and you don't feel shame that they're in this with you completely. That takes us to chapter 3. Chapter 3, I hope that there's in the white space between the end of chapter 2 and chapter 3, I sure hope that there was some time where they really got to enjoy Eden. We don't know it, just the first verse in chapter 3 says, now the serpent. So now, when when did that happen? Well, I'm I'm not exactly sure. It could have happened soon. It might have happened uh, right away. It just says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, It says, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? He twists what God said. So the serpent here we later learn is uh, the devil, and the devil is coming to tempt Eve. If Genesis 3 is trying to tell us anything here, is that God is not the tempter, and God is not there at this moment, okay? Of course, he's there spiritually, but he's not in, in, the, in the way this was the, the interaction they had with God, he doesn't have that presence with them at this moment. They're being tempted outside of that, okay? So God is not involved in this bringing of this evil. It's the serpent. It's the devil. And the woman corrects him. She says, we may eat fruit from, any, uh, from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must, must not touch it or you will die. A lot of ink has been spilled because she adds this phrase, you must not touch it. Did she, was she overthinking it? Or was that the way that Adam told her just to be careful? Or did he misinterpret it? Or there's all kinds of things. She does add the phrase, um, you must not touch it. Could be. We're not exactly sure. So it's, it's interesting. Um, but obviously, well, the big point here is she knows that there's a tree. It's in the middle of the garden. And it, it is this, uh, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're not to do that. And the serpent now lies. And he says, you will certainly not die. And that's a total lie. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Okay? So, you won't die. Total lie. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Total truth. And that you'll be like God. Half truth. Knowing good and evil. Okay, so God knows good and evil, but not personally. (laughs) He doesn't embody it. He doesn't know evil that way. He does know that there's evil. He's very aware of it, right? Whereas Adam and Eve are not. They're totally innocent at this point. They don't get that. So the the serpent is extremely crafty. And this is the way lies always come to you from the devil. They never come to you just straight up just lies, you know. Uh, if you do this, you'll get a trillion dollars or something. It's, it's never like that. It's a little bit of a truth, a little bit of a lie, and it's just enough to get you to think maybe that's a good idea. And that's exactly what happens to Eve. She starts thinking about this. And when it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Now, she knows that God makes things that are good for food and pleasing to the eye, but she's never tasted this. So she doesn't know that this is good for food. (laughs) She doesn't know that. It could taste terrible. But she's in her mind's eye. She's saying it must be. And then it's pleasing to the eye, which, of course, that's what all the trees God had made. They were pleasing to the eye, sure. And then here's the kicker. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. Now, what's the wisdom she was going to get by eating this? Well, you will know good and evil. Now, what's going on here? This is the very thing God said. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. She says, it's wisdom. I will be getting wisdom. So what does she do? She took some and ate it. Now, if you're reading through the account at this point in time, you're going, oh, no. Your first time through it, maybe. You're going, oh, no. If only Adam had been there. Eh, Guess what? She also took some, excuse me, she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. Where's Adam in all of this? He's standing right there the whole time. He's not doing anything. He's got the remote control in his hand. He's watching ESPN. It's just a rerun of the game he's already seen. But he's, <laughs> of course, he's not that. But but he's not engaging. Larry Crabb has written a great book. I've never read the book. I'll be, I have the book. I've never read it. Just called The Silence of Adam, where we refuse to enter in and, and to move in ways to protect others or to, to care for them. It's the silence. He doesn't do anything. And that's what, what, what Adam does. And he eventually eats it. And then it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So what happens? Their eyes were opened. That was true. They realize they're naked. So shame enters the world. They try to cover up. Then it says, verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That is no accident why that's there. When is the cool of the day? It's a very hot day here today in Minneapolis. Cool of the day is when the sun goes down, right? And it starts to get cooler. That's the day when your work is done. That's the part of the day when you can sit down, maybe you sit outside, have a nest tea with a big ice, you know, a big thing of ice and just sip it and just enjoy it. Or in this case, just take a stroll with someone and just enjoy the evening cool air, right? And this verse right here describes what their relationship was like. It says, God walked with them in the garden at that time, that strolling time of the day. They had that kind of a relationship with God, that close. Oh, it's so painful to read that because by the time, you know, spoiler alert, that's ultimately what we're going to get back in Revelation 21 when it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pray, uh, pain and that God will will be, have be with them, he'll be their God, he will dwell with them. It's in many ways a return to the type of relationship we had here in the garden. Instead, when they hear him this time, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Now, at this point in the Bible, maybe you you know you're going through it. You're brand new to the Bible, brand new to God. I, who is this God? What are his capabilities? Well, later you learn that God knows everything, past, present, future. He knows all those kind of things. But, but again, God is the master teacher, and he calls out to the man and says, where are you? And Adam does answer. He says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So there's a new thing that has come into the life of Adam and Eve, and it's shame. Okay, Shame has entered in. And, and so he hides. So, you know, thinking about hiding from an om- omnipotent, omniscient God, which means an all-powerful and an all-knowing God, is ridiculous, right? But he does it. And then God answers back, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat from? Right? Who told you that you were naked? Now, God knows full well the answer to both these questions. <laughs> He's asking them so Adam will fess up to them. The, have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from is a simple yes or no question, right? It's like when you see a little kid, he's got Oreo crumbs all over his face, and you ask him, did you eat that cookie I told you not to eat? It's a simple yes or no question. Look at verse uh, 12 and the first two words out of Adam's mouth. The woman. The first two words out of Adam's mouth are the woman. My mentor, Rob Boyd, likes to say it this way. If you can't handle the shame, you always move to blame. We had a phrase when we were growing up, uh, when the kids were growing up here, and we we had forbidden words. And one of the forbidden words was, yeah, but. In other words, I did a bad thing, but that other person, it's really their fault because they did a worse thing. Like, I'm not talking about them right now. I'm talking about you and what you did. The woman. The third word of out, of out of Adam's mouth ups the ante quite a bit on who Adam is actually blaming. It says, the woman you put here with me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so he's not just blaming God. Remember that woman that you made? The woman you brought to me? I was totally fine before you brought her. God, ultimately, this is your fault. Wow. So then God, uh, he says, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. God then asks Eve, what is this you've done? She answers a little bit more accurately, at least answers a question God does, but she also does blame shifting or what we'd call now gaslighting. You, you, you put it downstream to the next person. She, she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then we go through and we're going to read from there. Genesis uh, 3.14 all the way through verse 19 is what's called the curse. It's what happens on the earth as a result of now the knowledge of good and evil being embodied in humanity. And different people have said that this is the the pronouncement of God, the judgment that he's saying. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that he's saying, listen, you've done this, and I'm just going to tell you what that means for you, right? So it could be a little bit of both uh, even, you know? He starts with the the serpent, talks about as a physical being, the serpent type thing is now going to be crawling on the belly, so we don't know what the the form of a serpent was before that, but now it's going to look like a snake. And then in verse 15, one of the most important verses in Genesis regarding the future, it says, I will put enmity or enmity, strife between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so this now is going to be a theme throughout scripture of evil constantly coming against humanity and this, this offspring, the offspring, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, there's going to be this constant battle. And ultimately, this is going to be resolved at the cross of Jesus Christ, right? He will, it says, strike his heel, but he will get a deathly uh, crush to the head. And that's what happens at the cross of Jesus. This is very famously called the proto which which says 
the first proclamation of the gospel. Now, again, if you're reading it through the first time, you don't, oh, Jesus. No, but in reading it backwards, you go, oh my goodness, yet. And that's one of the Bible study tools we talk about is reading the Bible backwards. In other words, looking at it saying, how does the New Testament understand the fulfillment of these things? And that's one of them. To the woman, he says, you're going to get much greater pains in childbearing. And then this, this perfect relationship you had with your husband where you're both naked and not ashamed, that he honors you, that he looks at you and says things like, uh, you're, you're the best. And he speaks poetry over. That's what he does when he says, you're not bone of my bone, flesh, my flesh. This now changes. And it says, your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. We'll see that word in just a minute. Uh, that's not a positive thing. They're both ruling over one another and it just goes up, up. Yeah. Oh yeah. You did this. Oh yeah. You burned the bacon. Well, if you were worthy of coming home on time, maybe I would have done something for you. Well, that's just your brother. I don't like that. Oh yeah. Well, I should have never married you and on and on and on. That's the fall in relationships. And he looks at Adam and says this. He says, guess what? Curse is the ground because of you. We live on a cursed ground right now. And it's, 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 it requires painful toil. Not just work, but painful toil. It's going to produce thorns and thistles, sweat of your brow. You'll eat your food. And then it says this, until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. In other words, you're going to die. You're going to physically die. They spiritually died at this moment. But they're going to physically die. And death enters the world. So you will certainly die in one sense. No, it doesn't happen immediately. In another sense, yes, it does. And every person from that time on dies because of the fall. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, We have creation. We have fall. And then from Genesis 3, starting in verse 20, uh, we have the beginning of a redemption story that's going to take its place all the way through the Old Testament. It's going to bring us to Christ, that Christ is coming to redeem us. And this whole story is going to be set up in how God is going to deal with this problem. And it's beautiful. It says he, made, he, he, made, he killed animals to give them garments of skin so they'd have permanent um, covering. And he also then blocks them. He blocks them from the Garden of Eden, puts an angel there, cherubim, and says, you, no, you are not allowed back in. And the reason is because we don't want them eating from the tree of life now and that they'll stay eternally in this position. That would not be gracious. It's gracious that God doesn't do that to them. So they're kicked out. That brings us to chapter four. Chapter four, there's all kinds of things taking place. The big thing I want to, and this is from now on, I'm basically going to highlight some things. Um, We find that there are children involved, okay? And uh, the first child is a, is a son by the name of Cain, and later it's uh, the, another one, uh, second child is given the name Abel. Were there more children? Quite possibly. In fact, we'll, we'll see where that makes, seems to make some sense, but you know, whatever. We, we, get the, we get the concept here. We got two boys, Cain and Abel, and there's this, this, there's this they both come to God to give an offering. And the offering that Abel gives is seen with favor, but Cain's is not. And a lot of people spill a lot of ink on why that is, and that's not actually the important thing of the story. The important thing is that Cain and Abel are uh, stories of what do you do when life brings a disappointment? And what does Cain do? Cain becomes very angry. And God speaks to Cain, and he says this, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, this is one we talked about when we talked about Romans one thirty two, where we talked about this ordinance of God, this law that's written on your heart, the conscience, so to speak. You don't, don't, Cain doesn't have to have a law from God. There's no law written here. There's nothing in here saying, thou shalt not kill thy brother. Cain knows he shouldn't. Why? Because he's got the knowledge of good and evil. But the knowledge of good and evil is not just like, I know what's good and bad, and I'll do the good. The knowledge of good and evil is off at an embodiment, and it often then inflames us to say, I don't care. I'm going to do what's bad. I'm going to do. That's what God's saying here. 
Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you. Now, that word desire is the same word that's used in your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. It's not a good like, oh, that's no fair. I desire him. I desire you, baby. And you just ruling over me. No, no, no. It's basically saying, uh, I'm ruling over you. You're ruling over me is the way that word is being used here. And it turns out that Cain deceives his brother. Hey, man, let's go out in the field. And he goes out there and he kills him out into the field. God, once again, comes to Cain and does the same thing they did with his daddy and says, where's your brother Abel? God knows full well where his brother Abel is. And Abel answers one of the most famous phrases that is repeated in culture over and over. He says, basically, I I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Total lie. I do know where he is. And I was my brother's murderer. And God says, there's going to be punishment for you. Look what you've done. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And here's going to be this consequence for you. It is, it is harsh. Cain's life is going to be harsh. And we go on there and we get now, um, we get Cain wandering off and he starts to have children. Um, and then we have, uh, you start to see a whole list of people that come. And then comes uh, this an, an, another child named Seth and he starts to have children as well. Okay. Then we get to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 is the beginning of of how sin is now taking a, a, a strong grasp of everything. We're only five chapters into the Bible, and things get really nasty. We start seeing a list of people going on and on, and it goes through, and you start to see these people, and they live a long time, okay? But it's really an introduction to this period of time where we get to the very end of chapter 5, and it says, after Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, we get this guy named Noah and his three sons. Then it goes on. Uh, I'm just going to, just for the sake of time, I'm going to go to six, chapter 6, verse 5, and it says, The Lord God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Sin had now gotten to a place where people knew the knowledge of good and evil, and they did evil. They just chose evil, 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 evil. It was just anarchy. Everyone was doing evil, all kinds of things. And God says, he uses, even uses the phrase, I regret that I've made humanity. And so he says, I'm gonna, there's still a salvation plan here, but guess what? For only very few. And it's gonna be Noah, and it's gonna be his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And they and their wives, so that's four men and four women, and one of each gender of animal are going to get onto this boat, an ark. And I know we let our children play with Noah's Ark, but actually it's, it, it's a picture of the unfettered wrath of God upon the earth. I guess he does rescue a few, but it's, it's pretty horrific. I mean, it is just this massive flood that everything else dies. And that takes us all the way through Genesis chapter 8. We get to Genesis chapter 9, and God makes a covenant there with him and his sons. And he says this, be, this is Genesis 9, 1, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Once again, they are to steward the earth. They are the, they are the top of the food chain, so to speak here. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants. Now I give you everything And then he goes on to say um, that he says, I'm establishing my covenant with you. This is verse eight, with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock and all the wild animals and all that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I established my covenant with you. And here it is. 
Never again will all life be destroyed by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy all the earth. Okay? Now, a lot of questions are like, well, why does God do a flood then if he's not going to do it again? Does he regret doing the flood? Regret is a difficult word in scripture. God isn't sorry in the sense that, oh, I made a mistake. He is just saying, this has gotten to a certain point where I need to put a cease to it. And he shows... He shows in Genesis chapters, uh, starting in verse chapter six or even five, the the lineage to get up to Adam to Noah, but six, seven, and eight. There's three chapters. He shows what the justice of God would look like. In other words, if if you and I did not have Christ, this would be what we'd be waiting for. We would be waiting for waters. Because it'd just be judgment. And it, and it should cause us to kind of shudder in fear, right? And you'd think that's what would happen with Noah. He gives them a sign of the covenant, and the sign of the covenant is that he's going to give them this rainbow in the sky. So this, the sign of a rainbow is this covenant that I will not destroy all life with a flood. It's a sign of my covenant. And then it goes on to say that shortly thereafter, Noah go ahead, goes ahead and plants himself a vineyard. He gets hammered from the wine, so it's a very premeditated act. You gotta, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta plant these grapes. You gotta wait for the grapes to mature. It sometimes takes a while. You got to then put them into a vat. You got to get all this. You got to wait for it to ferment. Then you got to get hammered on it. And while he's in there. He lay uncovered. He lay naked inside of his tent. So there's just some shenanigans going on here. One of the brothers comes and and saw his brother that way, and he makes, it seems to be that he makes fun of it and doesn't cover him. The other two cover him. And so the the son that uh, made fun of him, he's under a curse as well. So guess what you're seeing right here? We just got done. We're just off the boat. And all of a sudden, sin is taking shape again, and we get... A new, uh, a new line that is going to do this. That brings us to chapter ten, and that brings us to this list. It's called the Table of Nations. It just it lists all these different people that are descendants. So people are really spreading. There's many more uh, people in all of this, and uh, in there in the Table of Nations uh, that actually will become very important because of. Our last chapter we're going to look at here, and that's chapter 11. Chapter 11, the little town says the Tower of Babel, or Babel. Some people say Babel, but Babel is uh, the more common way of saying it. And it says this, Now the world had one language and a common speech. As the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly They used bricks instead of stone and tar for a mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, and here's the kicker, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. What's the point of this? Well, They want to make a name for themselves. Does that ring a bell? What was the serpent saying to Eve in Genesis 3? Genesis 3, he says, no, this won't happen. God knows that when you eat of it, you will be like God. And here now, we see not just wickedness, not just murder and strife and shame and all kinds of uh, sexual sin or whatever. Here we actually see the sin of what's called hubris or the sin of, I want to declare myself a God. And it says, the Lord God came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. So the, the Lord God said, if as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord God scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because the Lord, there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. 
From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And it's the beginning of nations. You get nations that are held together by geography and by language, and it's no longer a common language. This is the beginning of of also strife, right? Because I don't get along with people who are not my geography and don't speak my language. You're a threat to me. And that's what takes place. That's the, the context where it takes us all the way from through more and more people. There's a big genealogy there. And then it gets to a man by the name of Abraham. Abram is his name, A-B-R-M. A-B-R-A-M, excuse me. And later his name will be changed to Abraham. But out of all of these nations, there's nothing special. God chooses one man, Abram, and says, I will make you into a certain nation. And there's going to be something about you. And the rest of the nations are outside of that special place. Now, we'll find out, we we spent a lot of time in Romans Untangled, that the Jewish people thought that they were very special. And in one sense, they were. They were God's special choice. He chose them. But in another sense, they weren't. They're just a microcosm of all the nations. They had it as good as you can get it. They had the direct oracles of God. They had God doing miracles for them, all these different things, and yet they blew it. Whereas the other nations had maybe not as direct contact with God. They they knew things just based on their conscience. They knew things about what was the knowledge of good and evil and all those kind of things. And yet, um, they also blew it. So the book of Romans is teaching us that these nations, there's in, in essence, there is really nothing different from them, although there is something different. The, 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 the Jewish people did get the oracles and the ways of God, but they fail in them. The same way, the Gentiles don't have those, but they know what's on their heart, and they also break it. That's the first 11 chapters. That's a buggy ride. Could we spend another hour? Oh, I'm sure we could. Those are the the big things that I've found super helpful, especially as I've looked at things in the New Testament, Book of Romans and other places. I hope that you have enjoyed this uh, bit of me just opening the Bible to Genesis and talking. (laughs) Uh, I hope you have a great week. And I want to thank you for joining me this whole season. Uh, for Romans Untangled and for this special bonus episode. Uh, May God richly bless your summer. Uh, And may we all come back this fall. I'm hoping to kick things off again uh, in in late August with a recap edition. And then in September, we'll kick off with um, with season two. May this summer be a summer that we all get a better, deeper, heart-changing reading of God's incredible word and may that lead us to a greater understanding of Jesus Christ. Thanks for listening.